So good afternoon. My name is Gary Olson, and I'm president of what I believe to be one of the finest small colleges in this nation, Damon College. I'm pleased to welcome all of you <laughs> to our second Damon College Distinguished Leaders uh, Lecture. We're deeply honored today to have as our second distinguished leader uh, the Majority Leader of the U.S. House of Representatives, Congressman Eric Cantor of Virginia. Now, the intent of this series is to bring to campus political leaders, government officials, and members of the judiciary from both political parties and from all parts of the political spectrum. Uh, we encourage these leaders to share their views on issues of regional, state, national, and international significance. And we welcome all of these officials to Damon in the spirit of bipartisanship and respect. Now, I'm going to leave the formal introduction of the majority leader to another distinguished leader in our region, the Honorable Chris Collins, who, as you know, represents the 27th District uh, of New York. Congressman Collins is in his first full term in the U.S. House of Representatives, representing a district that uh, reaches all the way to the Finger Lakes and includes 105 towns spread out over eight counties. I don't know how he keeps up with all that. Congressman Collins is a member of several important House committees, including the Small Business, the Agricultural and Science, and the Space and Technology Committees. And he chairs the Small Business Subcommittee on Health and Technology. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from North Carolina State University and an MBA in Finance from the University of Alabama in Birmingham. The Congressman has served as the Erie County Executive, and he's established an impressive 36-year track record as an entrepreneur and business owner in the private sector. I know that Congressman is especially proud of his lifelong distinguished membership and service in the Boy Scouts of America. Please help me in welcoming the Honorable Congressman Chris Collins. Well, I'm very happy to be here today with uh, Gary. You know that a politician is working very hard when he loses his voice, which I did three days ago. But it's that part of the season, and with 105 towns, uh, my staff now knows just how far they can push me, and they just pushed a tad further. So I will get through this, but please excuse uh, the voice. You know, Gary and I have been in our respective jobs each for 14 months. I can only hope that Gary is enjoying his job as much as, as I am truly enjoying mine and an honor to serve many of the people in this room. So, Damon College, you know, Gary's not from around here and I asked him earlier what he thought of Damon College and everything was over the top, but starting with more than he would have ever expected. But I can also tell you the stellar reputation that Damon College has is only going to be enhanced as Gary continues his service here. I want to have, and I do have the distinct honor to introduce to you our keynote speaker this afternoon, the Honorable Eric Cantor. Eric serves with distinction as Majority Leader of the United States House of Representatives. Eric has represented the people of Virginia's 7th Congressional District since 2001. And Eric was elected by his colleagues as majority leader for both the 112th and the current 113th Congress. As a representative and a member of the House leadership team, Eric has earned a reputation as a strategic thinker and ideas-driven leader. As a former small businessman, the leader does understand how Main Street impacts, for better or worse, businesses throughout this country. In Congress, Eric has worked to lower taxes, eliminate excessive regulations, strengthen small business, and encourage entrepreneurship. He understands the needs of today's working families and fights to make Washington work for them, not against them. A lifelong resident of the Richmond area, Eric and his wife Diana have three children. It has been my pleasure to get to know Eric personally while I was running for Congress, and certainly now since I've become a member. Even as a new member, or a freshman as they like to call us, 
I'm too old to be a freshman, but I don't know. we'll just go with it. I've always found the leader to be accessible, eager to listen, and engaged on the issues important to this district. Well, this is the 26th and the 27th district. That's how it works. It's my honor to serve with Eric, to welcome him back to Western New York, and introduce him this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Majority Leader of the House of Representatives, the Honorable Eric Cantor. Chris, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a, it, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here in Western New York. First time in Amherst, first time at Damon College. Uh, and uh, I want to say hello to my uh, good friend, mentor, Tom Reynolds, who's here. Tom was one of the first folks that I met when I was elected to Congress and started serving in 2001. Of course, Jack Quinn, it's great to see him as well. Uh, a real pleasure. And I will say to my good friend, Chris Collins, awesome without a voice. Um, <laughs> You say all those nice things. I'm just sorry I didn't bring my wife with me. So, uh, but um, delighted, delighted to be here and a participant in this series. And I want to say to President Olson, uh, Bobby Mills, and others, uh, Brian Rusk, others who uh, allowed for this to happen. It's it's a real honor for me to be here. And uh, obviously, a lot going on uh, right now. Uh, and uh, a lot of a lot of folks in this region. I know not unlike so many other parts of the country, uh, feeling challenged today. And I think the reality is, is, is too many families in America today are worried. They're worried about our country. They're worried about the America that their kids are going to grow up in. And the worry is so acute, I would even suggest that the number one issue facing this country today is on behalf of those kids that folks are worried about, can we restore an America that works? And I look at Damon's uh, logo and, and uh, statement of mission, a world of opportunity. Can we make sure that America works and can be that world of opportunity again for our kids? You know, if you think about it, the promise of America has always been that there's no limits, that there's no limits to what one can accomplish, so long as you're willing to work hard and play by the rules. That's what the promise of this country has been, that if you do that, then you can accomplish the American dream. And as a parent who's got two in college, and believe me, my pocketbook feels it, uh, one already out, but as a parent, to know that we can leave this world just a little better off for the next generation, for those that are here at Damon and elsewhere, that's what it's about. And it's about more liberty. It's about more opportunity. It's about more prosperity. That's what we all strive for. That's what I know Chris and I and others are working for in Washington today. And in fact, if we can accomplish our mission, then we will have an America that works. But again, today, there are so many who have lost faith in this notion of the American dream. There are so many that really are wondering this question about America working. And unfortunately, that is not without reason because the current economic situation is posing a serious threat to so many people. And in, in a sense, you can see trends in the media, trends in Washington, of those that want to accept somehow this new normal. And when I say this new normal, I mean the fact that there's right now one out of every six working age male can't find work right now. That's not something that we should accept. It shouldn't be normal for wages to remain stagnant. It shouldn't be normal to leave middle class families of having to struggle to pay the bills and wondering whether they can get ahead. That's not normal for America. And it shouldn't be normal for us to have to accept 
a government-run health care system that discourages work, that raises costs, and that denies someone the opportunity to see the doctor that they want to see. And finally, it should not be normal for us to have a K-12 education system that is failing most of our vulnerable children. And I'm told, I was just in Rochester a little bit earlier today, that the urban schools there and the school system in Rochester have produced an alarming ratio that for black high school students, the graduation rate is 9%, is what I was told this morning. That is an alarming trend. That is a scaring trend. That is not something that we should accept as normal. So this is why the House Republican majority that Chris and I are proud to be a part of, this is why we reject this new normal. And we have put forward an agenda of one that says the American people deserve better. That we embrace the idea that we can build and enact a policy agenda based on common sense, conservative solutions to the most pressing problems facing America's, Americans today. And we are fighting for an America that works for everybody again. So we're going to pursue this agenda this year by concentrating on four different areas. One is creating jobs and strengthening our economy. Two is unclenching the squeeze on middle class America. Three is providing an alternative to Obamacare and a better way in health care. And four is creating more opportunities for young Americans by strengthening our education sy system with the expansion of school choice. Now, as we all know, the economy has been stagnant for some time. Unemployment that we just heard again last week remains high. The figures are 6.7%. And our labor participation rate remains dangerously low. But you have to look a little closer to get the full picture. The unemployment rate for Americans with a college degree is much lower. It's about 3.2%. But not everyone has a college degree. In fact, 70% of this country doesn't have a college degree. And for those with a high school diploma only, the unemployment rate is 7.1%. Those who don't finish high school, it's a lot higher. The bottom line is, America doesn't work if Americans aren't working. So our economy demands a diversity of jobs to be created that reflects the diversity of our people. I was just talking to uh, Jack Quinn, who, as you know, is the president of the community college here. Uh, and I think he and I can both agree we've got a lot to do when it comes to skills and craftsmanship. And so our House majority will produce a jobs plan that starts with what we call the Skills Act. The act that was passed last March helps those who are looking for work by removing arbitrary roadblocks and allowing job seekers to, ex to accept job training and workforce development programs tailored to the individual needs. The Skills Act will help Americans all over the country, especially the Americans here in western New York, who have grown up with this sense of manufacturing, of making sure that America makes things. The New York Department of Labor said the following about western New York. There is an emerging consensus about the need for more skilled tradesmen to replace aging workers. Essentially, they went on to say, skilled tradesmen are retiring faster than they can be replaced. And so the Skills Act is a giant leap forward to training those workers that this is the act that we passed last March. Unfortunately, the bill sits idle, not having been taken up in the United States Senate. This year, we are going to continue to work and encourage the United States Senate to take up this bill because there's simply no good reason to keep good job training programs for those from those looking for a good job. Now, our agenda is going to attack what, again, I term as a middle, middle class squeeze. Many folks have not seen a wage hike in years. 
Median incomes in America today are lower than they were in 2000 for households. And costs for the essentials we know are going up. This squeeze on both ends, without wage growth and with the squeeze from added costs of just living, is making it harder for working families just to make ends meet. America should not be a place where three out of four working Americans say they're living paycheck to paycheck. And that's what the American people are now saying, three out of four. One of the ways that we have and will continue to address this middle class squeeze is by pursuing sound energy policies. I'm sure you know here in western New York, as well as anywhere in the country, that this winter has been particularly brutal. Chris tells me you're waiting for another round of weather tomorrow. <laughs> Along with record low temp temperatures have, have come in many parts of the country east of the Continental Divide have seen record high heating bills. I noted in the news a couple weeks ago that 49 of the 50 states had snow this year, save for Florida, 49 of the 50. And I about everyone here in Amherst, New York, in the greater Buffalo region knows exactly what I'm talking about when you're talking about home heating bills here in the beginning of March. This has caused millions of working moms and dads to have to sit around the kitchen table wondering how they're going to afford to keep the heat on. And there are a few concerns greater, this time of year especially, than being able to heat your home and provide for your family. Now, as a result, the House of Representatives acted last week in what we deemed Home Heating Week. And we tried to put forward and successfully pass bills that reformed uh, the, and the, uh, the regulatory process and the infrastructure problem plaguing the expansion of energy supplies and trying to make energy more accessible and more affordable for working families. The goal of these reforms is very simple. Let's lower heating costs for working families. Wage earners everywhere have more important things to worry about than Washington making it more expensive for them to heat their home. Now, one of those things that people are worried about continuously is that thing called health care. Now, the president's health care law went into full effect almost. It's in stages, but in much fuller effect uh, this year. And in my opinion, the president's health care law has been anything but that which the, pro which the president promised the American people. After the administration's disastrous rollout, Almost six million people had their plans canceled nationwide. Others are seeing higher premiums and higher deductibles. Small business owners, seniors, and working families are losing access to doctors and pediatricians that they liked and that they trusted. Some in Washington have yet to come to terms with this. Others there believe the story about Americans losing their health care plans as completely made up. The truth is, people are hurting. A few months ago, a constituent of mine, his name is Bruno, he sent me a copy of a letter sent to him by his insurance company. And the letter said explicitly, quote, to meet the requirements of the new laws, your current plan can no longer be offered. Now, Bruno, he's single, he's 61 years old, and he's self-employed. And a new plan, he was told, could cost him hundreds, even thousands of dollars more, limiting his options to choose from. Now, America should not have to worry about coming home from work to open their mailbox to find that their health insurance has been taken from them. If America is going to work, we need a health care system that works. Repealing Obamacare has always been a goal of House Republicans. And while it will continue to be, a repeal alone is not enough. Over the next year, we're going to be focused on patient-centered reforms and alternatives that reduce cost, maintain access to doctors and pediatricians, and to hospitals, and to help those with pre-existing conditions while covering more people and actually bringing costs down for everyone. That is our goal. It should be our goal.
Finally, we'll be focused on expanding opportunities for young Americans. The first step towards a world of opportunity, as Damon so proudly promotes, is having an opportunity to live the American dream with a good education. But right now, as we said before, as I heard this morning in this region, just like so many others, access to a quality K through 12 education is a very pressing challenge and frankly is not a reality for a lot of kids. And we in the, in the House this year continue to explore education opportunities through school choice for young Americans, including the expansion of charter schools. Now, education opportunities through school choice are growing in America, and they're growing here in Western New York. Now, I've read that Western New York itself has thousands of kids in 17 different charter schools. These schools offer families and students the opportunity to get the education they deserve in the environment that is conducive and one that they choose. Now, one would think that the expansion of school choice giving parents the ability to say, my child deserves better, would be an issue all of us could agree on. And there is some hope towards that end. Take, for example, gov your governor, Andrew Cuomo. Now, I would probably guess that he and I don't agree on a lot, <laughs> but he has been a great partner in supporting charter schools. And I want to be the one to applaud him and commend him for being part of this effort. Now, New York City's new mayor, Bill de Blasio, has taken a different tact. Mr. de Blasio recently informed four charter schools in the city that they could lose their physical location, their buildings. One of these schools, the Success Academy Harlem Central Middle School, is a top performing school in New York City. An overwhelming majority of the students who benefit from these programs in that city and your state are low-income minority students. These schools are so popular that over 50,000 kids are on the waiting list to get in. Again, New York City having the largest system in the country, one of the most successful in terms of school choice, as noted by the Brookings Institution, has about 70,000 kids that are benefiting from that option. You've got to ask, why would Mayor de Blasio want to stand in the way of these kids who are just looking to get ahead? Now, unfortunately, Mayor de Blasio is not the only politician trying to stop the expansion of school choice. In Washington, Attorney General Eric Holder, through the court system, has been busy trying to shut down the Louisiana Scholarship Program. This is a voucher program in Louisiana championed by my good friend and their governor, Bobby Jindal. It allows children who live below the poverty level and are stuck in failing schools the ability to apply for funds to receive them and to attend a school outside of their home district, a school that it could offer a better way for their education. I've been to New Orleans on several occasions to see this work. And the program has been an enormous success. For the first time, many Louisiana school children of low-income families have a chance to attend a good school. They're only asking for a chance to lift themselves out of poverty. Why would Eric Holder, why would Eric Holder want to shut it down? Same question to Mayor de Blasio. Why would Mayor de Blasio want to shut these schools down? Now, when I think about education opportunity, there's some extraordinary heroes and stories to tell. And I think about this young man that I met on my last trip to New Orleans, and his name was Brian. Brian was an 11-year-old kid. He was the one chosen to give uh, me and the group I was with a tour of the school that he attended. He was a beneficiary um, of Governor Jindal's education scholarship program. So when we pulled up to the school that early afternoon in New Orleans, Brian greeted us outside. He was there, he was standing upright, he was in his uniform, and he had a smile from ear to ear. He couldn't wait to welcome us into his school. 
He wanted me to meet his teachers, his school and classmates. Couldn't wait to take us out onto the playground and show us where he played basketball with his friends. Couldn't have been more of an inspiration. I talked to him a little bit. He had a dream. He told me that he wanted to go to college and wanted to become a doctor. Now, I asked the principal more about Brian when I got a chance. And the principal told me that not unlike the other kids at that school, Brian came from a severely underprivileged background in the inner city of New Orleans. Brian he was a minority child. He came to that school way below grade level in terms of performance. Brian had never, ever met his mother. The only way and the only time he talks to his father is through prison bars. Brian is also being raised by his grandma. And then the principal told me that just a few weeks before, Brian had found out that his grandma had been diagnosed with cancer. So I guess you could say that Brian really doesn't have a lot of hope outside that school. But he sure had that school. And so you got to ask, what will happen to Brian if Eric Holder is successful in taking away that scholarship? Who's going to go to Brian's grandma and look her in the eye and tell her and her grandson that he can no longer have the opportunity to attend that school? That he can no longer have that hope and that dream of going to college and becoming a doctor? Only the enemies of opportunity of school choice would be the ones to do that. And America should not be a place where kids and parents have to worry about politicians and their government keeping them from attending the school of their choice. That's not how America should work. So going forward, Chris and I and others in the House are going to be fighting for hard for kids like Brian, for working middle class families who are stuck in that squeeze to expand solutions that work for everybody, not just for the privileged few. That's what our agenda is about. Now, in closing, I just want to point to um, a statement that was made in Ronald Reagan's inaugural address. It was then, in 1981, that President Reagan said, it is not my intention to do away with government. It is rather my intention to make government work, to work with us, not over us, to stand by our side, not ride on our back. And I strongly believe that we can work towards that end. No matter which side of the political aisle you stand on, no matter which political party one is a part of, we all should be for a government that works with us, not against us, for America that works for all of us. Thank you all very, very much for having me. The leader has a tight schedule, but he's uh, here for a, a short while and can take some questions. Uh, Bobby Mills has the microphone, so uh, if you raise your hand, he'll come over to you. All we ask is that you stay on the topic of the speech and not other topics, okay? I'm Kyle Sims. I am a senior at Amherst High School. This is us over here. Welcome. Uh, <laughs> welcome. Uh, I know you're really upset getting out of school, so, um, but yes. welcome. Glad you're here. Um, you mentioned the story about um, Brian and the charter school. And I'm wondering, with the rising cost of a college education, what is the federal government's role in helping working class families and middle class families pay for college? Great question, Kyle. Great question. And it is something that we will be working on. The House will be considering the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act this year. And uh, Chairman John Klein and the Education Workforce Committee are already about looking at things that we can do to help make college more affordable for more people. And um, the answer thus far 
um, has been, all we need to do is spend more money and we'll make it easier, better, more affordable. And in fact, the opposite has happened. Because if you look at folks your age and families such as yours that are looking at college, um, almost uh, half of the country says that they can't afford college. And equally, half the country said college is their avenue and their gateway to the middle class. So going back to the sense that I spoke, just spoke about, that we ought to be making sure America is working for everyone, that is a critical piece of it. How are we going to expand education opportunities, yes, in the secondary setting, but yes, beyond? Whether it's community college, whether it's apprenticeship and skills training, or whether it is a four-year university or beyond. And if you look at what's going on right now, there is a very difficult time uh, in terms of regulations being placed on accrediting uh, services, on institutions themselves. And in the House, what we'd like to do is be able to begin to see more innovation welcomed in uh, to academia and to the situation facing kids who want to pursue more schooling. Uh, you know that there is a tremendous push to have online education be a greater part of the education realm. I think there is tremendous opportunity for its integration into what has traditionally been campus-based only experiences. And some of the best universities in our country in this state and others are banding together to look at the potential for online education. How do we bring down the cost? How do we ensure that the quality stays the same and maintain the benefit of interaction physically while on a college campus? I think there's some very exciting potential out there, but we've got to be creative, got to start thinking out the outside the box and get out of this notion that there's only one way, which is to continue uh, to try and do the way we've always been doing. Uh, two more questions. Uh, hi, my name is Ryan O'Hearn and I'm a senior at DePue High School. And I'm the only one here, but. <laughs> Welcome. Um, are we like crosstown rivals or? Yeah. No, they're okay. <laughs> um, you mentioned early on on how there hasn't been any wage hikes and how wages seem to be staying the same while costs seem to be going up. And I wanted to get uh, how you felt about a possible increase in the minimum wage and reducing income inequality. Sure. Um, th there's no denying the fact that there is a growing disparity of income. There's no denying the fact that our policies have to be focused on um, wealth creation at all ends of the scale, not just at the higher end. So there is, I think, a lot of concern of this fact that wages have not gone up in real terms in 10 years. So my, my sense is this. We want bigger paychecks for people. But having government wave a wand and say, here, we'll make it so, is not a sustainable solution always. And if you look at what the president has proposed, he has proposed a minimum wage increase of over $10 an hour. And what I would say to the president, and have said before, is we can do what you want to accomplish without harming those who are going to be creating the jobs that we want more of. And that is, if you'll join us in rolling back this regulation under Obamacare that has changed the 40-hour work week to 30 hours. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the requirements under the law say that an employer uh, must have 50 employees deemed full-time in order to come under the mandates of the law. But that full-time has been defined under the law as 30 hours a week uh, not 40. So if we were to just restore that back to 40, that's a 25% increase in one's paycheck. And if you compare the numbers, a $10.10 minimum wage versus rolling back that regulation would yield $2 more 
for the wage earner per paycheck. But you're going to have the harmful effects, as the Congressional Budget Office indicated, of an increase in minimum wage on job creation. So my response to the President is, why don't we work together? Let's do what we can agree on now, which is roll back that regulation, make it so that folks have 25 percent more back in their pocket, and don't harm the outlook for job creation by employers the way that the Congressional Budget Office warned. So I believe there are ways for us to do this, again, that can work for everybody. I think, do you have time for two more? Sure. Great. Um, hi, my name is Shelley Schratz, and I'm a small business owner for 25 years in the restaurant industry. I have had hundreds of employees, or people who want to be employed, come to my door, as well as other businesses like mine. The government has made it so impossible for young moms or dads to get a job, to lift themselves up. And a, and a perfect example is, they come before me and they say, I'd like to work, but if I work more than so many days and hours, I'm going to lose my unemployment. Can you pay me off the books? My answer is no. This government is making people break the law, but you're breaking their spirit. There should be an incentive. And what kind of incentive do you have for that single mom who has four kids, one with Down syndrome, and needs to work because she needs to show her kids work ethic? I don't hear that or see that happening. Right. Um, I said earlier that the great promise of our country, the fact that we can leave this place a little better than the way we found it, is premised to me on the notion that this country, more than anywhere else in the world, you work hard, you play by the rules, you can get ahead. To your point of the dignity of work, the spirit of hard work, of innovation, which is what has allowed this country to excel and succeed. And over time, what we have seen with a lot of the programs that you refer to as safety net programs, we have seen the separation of those programs and their benefits from the willingness to work. And um, if we go back to the 90s, when President Clinton worked with a Republican Congress, what we saw was a coalescing around this sense of welfare reform, which was based on the notion that if you were going to get benefits, that you had to at least be willing to work. And we've been about the same issue, this Congress, when we dealt with the so-called Farm Bill uh, that had a big component in it of the nutrition program or food stamps. And what our position was is we want to support the safety net. As, as a society, as one that is advanced as ours, we should absolutely demonstrate the compassion for those who cannot help themselves. And we ought to be offering them a hand up, not just a hand out. And so what we try to do is to say that if we're going to continue to try and be that compassionate society, it is just as compassionate and, frankly, more worthwhile for us to make sure that someone gets back into a job and not just remain one who is relying uh, on a, prog a government program. So our, our notion is let's make sure that there is a willingness to work. In many parts of the country, there are no jobs. So you can't require one to have a job if they're down and out and don't have any help. But we can do things like say, please come in, offer oneself up for community volunteer or service, do something to demonstrate a will to give back and to contribute, and America will be there for you. That is what the, uh, that's the commitment and the compact between the government and the governed. 
that all of us are in this together. So I appreciate your question. I think we've got a challenge there, and we're making progress one step at a time, built on the premise of the success of the welfare reform program uh, that was instituted back in the 90s that somehow has been frayed over the last 10 years. Mr. Leader, you've been very gracious with your time. We have one last question. Hi, um, my name is Julia Cordani. I'm a junior at Sacred Heart Academy, and I just have a question regarding health care. You mentioned before that one of the Republican Party's main goals was to repeal Obamacare. And if so, I was curious as to what the party's goals are as far as reform, especially regarding health care and making it available to people of all socioeconomic standards and levels. Great question. And I had said that, that uh, many of us feel that the architecture design of Obamacare is something uh, that just won't work. And what we're seeing right now is evidence of that. Because what, go back to the situation of... Um, my constituent, Bruno. He's 61 years old, he's male, he's single. But yet, when he was told the plan he had to purchase because of Obamacare, he was told that he would have to have maternity coverage. Single, 61 years old, had to pay for maternity coverage. The reason why is the law says he has to. The reason why is Washington has decided for him and for everyone that comes under the individual plan such as that, that they've got to have the kind of coverage that Washington says they have to. That, what, that is a fundamental piece of Obamacare that does not work. And we Republicans are going to present an alternative that is a better way. And it's patient-based. And it says that families ought to be able to choose which kind of care that they have. If we want more coverage, as your question asked, if we want more of those at the bottom end of the ladder to have more coverage, we got to have a health care system that works. So we better start bringing down the cost for real. Obamacare discussion began by this president saying he wanted to bring down the cost. But somehow along the way, that aim was lost. And you can't have more coverage if you don't address the cost situation. So our plan is to bring down those costs, is to increase the choices. It's to say that folks ought to have the ability to choose the kind of plan that they want from the insurance company that they want to buy it from, not necessarily wed to a one state or another. We should create a national marketplace of choice. We should have the ability to pull together um, as associations, as businesses, to lower the risk, we should have the ability to purchase health savings accounts in, in the fashion that we want to, so that those of us who want to be involved in the, in the selection of our coverage and the decision of our care can be. Now, for those who are sick, those who have what is known as a pre-existing condition, we also want to help them. And that's been a real point of contention that the president and his side often say, well, those Republicans, you ask them about that. Well, we care about them too. And in fact, in 2009, we passed an alternative in the House when Obamacare was being voted on that spoke to those patients who were being denied coverage by their insurance companies because they had a pre-existing condition, they were sick. We said, we don't accept that, we don't want that. And what we did is we, in our plan is we said, let's create what is known as high-risk pools. Basically, an insurance pool or reinsurance pool that is there at all the state's level, adequately funded, and required to provide insurance without going hot, too high that's unaffordable for sick people. That way we can do this without spreading the cost to everyone. It's just a smarter way to go about it. But we do have an alternative. You will see us continue to work on that and bring it forward uh, this year. But excellent question. It will be very, um, I think, involved in the public debate as we go forward. Thank you all again. It's been a terrific audience. Thank you. Let's give him a real Damon round of applause.